Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, you know, some of the things that I've been involved with, um, some of my own companies, my own experiences. And uh, I'm going to get into um, you know, some of the stuff that's happening at you know, what we do at HP and also um, some of my other businesses that, I, that I've started recently as well as prior to HP. And um, I, I'm just going to kind of make it simple. Uh, I'm going to go through um, you know, my companies. I'm going to talk about Voodoo Innovation in particular. Uh, I'm talking about building a strategy. Um, you know, and, and what it involves and, and, and how, you know, building the right strategy can, can lead to immense success. And uh, talk about exit. So, you know, at, I, I, there's different types of exits and we'll, we'll get into that as well. And then I'm going to talk about being an entrepreneur in a big company. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really hard to explain, but, um, you know, when, when, you, when you go from running your own business and, and having you know, a staff of like 40 to 50 people going into a company where you know, we now have over 300,000 people. It's, it's an insane experience. And I always get asked, you know, why are you still there? Because you know, like, aren't you going crazy? I mean, I hear this all the time. And, um, and, and there's, there's a lot of reasons why I'm still at HP and, and why things are, are kind of still exciting for me. And then I'll just go over some random thoughts, which I normally do. And, uh, and then I'll just have a quick Q&A at the end, if, uh, if that's agreeable, if anyone has any questions. Um, so let me just start with Voodoo first. Um, Voodoo was uh, started in 1991. I, was, uh, I actually started it out of high school. And uh, the way it really worked was I, I took spares in my last year of high school, uh, my last semester where uh, all my spares allowed me to not go to school for six months. And uh, during that period of time, I started Voodoo out of my father's uh, flooring store. And he didn't know about it. And, um, and it was more like just like a selfish kind of thing. Like I, I wanted to build computers because I was very interested in them. And you know, I was literally building computers with a friend of mine on the floor of this uh, warehouse. And uh, you know, we were selling them very quickly just by placing an ad in the bargain finder, and it, one thing led to another, and boom, Voodoo came along. Um, but it, it started with, a, with an idea, and it started with, a, with you know, trying to be different and, and trying to bring innovation into a space that really had no innovation. Um, you know, people were putting out PCs like they were appliances. There were boring square boxes. There was nothing exciting about them. And that's how Voodoo started. And basically, over the years, we grew into this, uh, this, this amazing company. In 1999, I hired my brother, who helped bring focus around the brand and focus around what we really loved to do, which was gaming. Because every time you know, we, would, we would close the office, uh, we would all go back and default to what we, what we loved doing, which was playing games. And we would rip each other's heads off until 2 AM and then go home. So you know, video gaming was a big deal for us, and that's where our core was, and that's how we built our brand, and that is how our strategy was built around what we love to do, and that is why Dell and HP and other companies came calling us, and we didn't actually have to go out and pursue them um, at some point in time. Uh, <laughs> and I'll, I'll just talk about a couple of other companies that I started recently. Um, this, again, was based on an idea. It's called Bulls on Wall Street. And in 2008, I started to do research on Twitter. Um, and, and what I was trying to do was, was uh, uh, figure out you know, how to aggregate information and, um, and, and see how people were, were buying things, how they were reacting to products, and that sort of thing. And I found an interesting trend on Twitter where people were trading stocks. Uh, you know, and and, and they, were, they were saying what they were trading and what they were buying and what they were selling. And, uh, and the economy collapsed completely, as everyone knows. Um, and, uh, and there was a huge trend. Uh, one of the trends that, that I found was that um, people took control of their own finances. And so they started to go uh, firing their brokers, you know, getting rid of the expensive 2% brokers, and they started to open up discount trading accounts. So if you look at the trend, there was a huge trend of like, the number of people going out and opening up discount trading accounts, so like Quest Trade and E-Trade and those places. And they were starting to take control of their own finances. So you know, by using Twitter and aggregating all of that data, um, I came up with this experiment. I had a friend of mine create this algorithm that would go through all the trading data on Twitter. It would compare it to real live trading data. It would determine who were the best traders. 
based on their performance. There was no way to lie. Like there's no way to hide this stuff because it's very, you could very quickly catch a trend and see who was actually doing well and who wasn't. And, uh, and so we, you know, we, we built this little algorithm. Uh, we found the, the, the four, well, we found the top 10 traders and started following them. Um, and we put $80,000 into a bank account. And by the end of 2009, it was worth 2.4 million. Like it was just an unbelievable, you know, fluke of an experiment, to be honest. And um, so we had, we, we hired four of the top traders to create Bulls on Wall Street. And where it's going, we don't know yet. But I, I can say that, you know, what, what I, I think is going to happen is we're going to revisit our strategy and we're going to turn it into a framework for uh, professional traders to start their own businesses. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it, it started off again as an idea, an experiment, and it turned into something interesting. And now we're just kind of tweaking it to see where it can go. And then the last company that um, I got involved with um, prior to HP is called Bright Squid. And uh, this, again, from personal experience. You know, Voodoo, we, we, were, we were famous for creating liquid cooled PCs and, and bringing on technologies like fanless PCs and quiet PCs because of that very need, personal need, for me to have a, pers a personal, quiet, high performance computer in my bedroom. Bright Squid started, um, my father died in 2000 of a brain tumor. And uh, it, was a, it was a crazy malignant brain tumor. He, he, we found out in November he had a tumor, and by January 15th he died. It was, it was unbelievable. And um, you know, he didn't get to see some of the success that we had with Voodoo, which is you know, kind of disappointing. But the, the more disappointing part was that there were so many silos in medicine, and there's so many walls, and there's so much bureaucracy, and um, uh, I, I hate to use the word, but it's like, it's almost like arrogance in a sense that you know, some doctors are, are, are very much in their old dinosaur ways and, and you know, they, wanna, they wanna do things the way that they want to do things and they don't like to collaborate and whatnot. I met a friend who is a radiologist, interestingly enough, and he's actually, he's, he's my best friend. His name is Deepak Kora. And uh, what makes him different is he's an entrepreneurial radiologist. And he started off this, uh, this thing in residency where um, it was like a interesting cases tool that he used. And you know, back then he was taking pictures with a camera of all the scans that he made, and he would digitally archive them in a database so he could share them with his colleagues, which is really lame when you think about you know, the whole process that he had to go through to do this and why he was doing this. He was doing it to make himself and his colleagues into better doctors, and I thought that was interesting. So you know, eventually we got together and we said, and with another friend of ours who's an entrepreneur from Calgary, and said, uh, you know, why don't we take this concept of, you know, taking these scans that you're currently doing, now that everyone is going digital, and he, he himself, his clinics went completely digital, why don't we turn this into a collaboration tool for, you know, uh, medical professionals from all over the world to be able to collaborate, annotate interesting cases, um, you know, share ideas, and have, like, patient timelines. So, you know, you can look at an entire history of a patient from, from you know, birth, cradle to grave, essentially, and understand you know, what they have gone through with, with different medical things that, you know, they've had in their, in their past. And the great thing about this is you can then um, do comparisons. So, you know, my dad had a specific type of brain tumor. I could go on Bright Squid, do a comparison with someone else who's had a specific, the same type of brain tumor somewhere in India. He's eating some crazy chutney, and, you know, for some reason his brain tumor is receding. You know, we, we don't know what it is. But the bottom line is it's a great way to collaborate. And it's also a great way for the patients to become stewards of their own medical data. So we started Bright Squid, and it's doing really well. Um, in fact, it recently just got acquired. And uh, I'm still a, a shareholder of the company that acquired it, but we'll be in front of about 160,000 doctors and dentists, in fact, um, uh, very soon. Uh, the, the, the dental part is really interesting. So, so th those are three companies that I got involved with. And again, that's just through sort of personal you know, experiences. And I think all of us kind of go through that. Um, you know, we, we have a personal experience and we go out and we want to start something. Um, I don't know if it's, you know, if it's normal that we all go out and start a business and try to make it into a success, but it's really not that hard to do. It's, um, it's just a matter of uh, finding the right people, <laughs> getting like the best possible people you can possibly have, and keeping those people going. For example, uh, the, the, the lead industrial designer for Voodoo who does all of our graphics and that sort of thing is, is with me on Bulls and he's also with me on Bright Squid. So you, know, you, you, carry, you bring those people with you and, and keep on building on that success. And then the other thing is just you know, how you build your strategy. 
So I just want to talk about Voodoo really quick. Um, you know, before we got acquired by HP in 2006, one of our competitors, Alienware, uh, was just acquired by Dell for around 400 million and in March. And then in September of 2006, we got acquired by HP. And you know, we were like all over the news. We were in like every major you know, magazine. We'd won major awards everywhere. And uh, you know, there were mostly men's magazines, but the point is we were, you know, <laughs> which is probably one of the reasons that you know, we had such a niche. I was always wondering why women didn't know who Voodoo was. But, but uh, the, the point is, you know, we were, we were everywhere. And, and it, was a, uh, it, was, uh, it was picked up um, because of the cool systems we made, the design, you know, the, the thought leadership we had around gaming and performance. Um, so when we came into HP, we said, hey, you know, why don't we take Voodoo and, and create like this, this super ultra high beautiful performance PCs and then we can take a sub brand of that and put it onto HP systems. And we created this, this, this sub brand called Voodoo DNA. And we created a system called HP Blackbird which was uh, uh, launched in, in uh, 2007. And it was the most successful uh, PR product launch that HP has had in its history. It was, it was unbelievable how well received this, uh, this system was. And it was, you know, in 2006 when we came into HP, the, the designs weren't, they, they weren't really focused on design as much as they are now. Um, you know, things were kind of boring gray. Uh, I remember the, uh, the, the CEO at the time used to say that, you know, it, the, the, the designs came out of, straight out of the, the Soviet school of design. And that's exactly, you know, how it felt when we came in. But 50 people that came out of Voodoo went into HP and we basically changed the way HP thinks about design. And uh, we came up with some amazing machines. We came up with uh, you know, the Omen, the Blackbird, the Voodoo Envy was an ultra thin carbon fiber notebook. And by the way, Voodoo Envy became HP Envy and it's now all over the world. Um, we've got Dr. Dre doing promotions with it, with his Beats audio. And, um, and it's, 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 it's nice to see that something we created out of Calgary became a, you know, a global brand in, uh, in a very important industry. Um, you know, when it came to design, we, we were using things like carbon fiber uh, throughout the entire chassis of the notebook. Um, and so we really pushed the edge because most people would just use carbon fiber as, a, as, a, as a, something to look good, you know, but there was no function to it when it came to consumer electronics. But you know, carbon fiber actually has some great properties. It makes it stronger, you can make thinner devices, and um, you know, and generally the structure is better. It's just more expensive. So you know, we really pushed the edge. We use things like extruded aluminum to create the, uh, the Voodoo Omen, which you know, again, the <laughs> I, I, just, I can't even begin to explain to you the process involved in creating like a masterpiece like this. But um, you know, the, the, the one company that's been able to kind of do that in scale is Apple, and they've done a really nice job of, you know, bringing design to the forefront of their portfolio. But, um, and, you know, we brought things like edge glass treatment and, and things that, you know, HP never really did before, but now they're starting to, to do, um, you know, in a big way. So, we even brought tattoos to the, uh, to the thing where, you know, we brought personalization. We felt that, you know, personalization was, uh, was a big deal and, and people wanted to personalize their computers, you know, and their consumer electronics as, as much as anything else, so. Um, so, I just wanna talk to you a little bit about innovation. Um, you know, there's, there's such thing as great innovations with no execution. And, uh, <laughs> and what ends up happening is somebody else comes along and takes your great idea and turns it into a product. And that happens all the time. That happens everywhere. It happens at HP, it happens all over the place. And I can tell you, we've got the most talented researchers at HP Labs and some of the stuff they're doing is, is amazing. But the real challenge is how do you execute and how do you turn that into you know, products. Um, this system here was, was uh, liquid cooled and it used convection to allow the heat to go up, uh, to rise. And uh, you know, most computers, I don't wanna bore you with these details, but uh, you know, most computers, basically the cards are put in such a way that the air cannot rise. But all we did was we just turned the board so that the air could rise. And so we, we did some, you know, some natural ideas where you, know, you could, you could uh, make a simple change to the architecture of a computer and change the way computers are designed by just turning the board and having the air you know, rise. 
Um, we did things like cable management, making things much neater on the back and the inside of the chassis. And then performance was like the, a huge deal for us. We would take the chips and we would clock them beyond what the manufacturer would clock them at because we would cool them in a way that allowed us to you know, deliver uh, great performance to the machines. And as a result of all those types of technologies, we won every major award again for the HP Blackbird system. So you know, the, the, the strategy of taking Voodoo, which is like a Ferrari, uh, and, and putting it into HP and, and, you know, and uh, taking HP's product upstream actually worked. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about that, you know, the innovation where you come up with an idea and, uh, and, and a vision and, and it, what can happen if it's not executed on. Um, this video I'm about to share with you is a, is a view at what was created four years ago at HP, okay? And it was a view of where gaming should go. And, and it, it was really about, you know, I have kids, many of you have kids, and we've seen that kids are now growing up on playing video games. And, uh, and parents worry about that. You know, they, they sit on the couch, they, they play their games all the time, they're not getting any exercise, like what are you gonna do? So, you know, we, we came up with this, uh, this idea of bringing kind of augmented reality into the, uh, into the game. So, uh, yeah, the lawyers really loved that when they saw it. Um, and, you know, what's going to happen if the kid gets hit by a car and, you know, all this other stuff. And so there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, challenges to, to, to doing stuff like that in a large company. But I'll tell you one thing that's, that's just completely amazing. There's a company called Parrot. And uh, they made, they, you know, if you get a chance, check out the video. Uh, they made a thing called the AR drone. And what it is, it's a remote control helicopter with, uh, with four blades. And uh, it has a camera on the bottom and a camera on the front. And um, it uses your iPad or iPod touch. And you can actually see what's going on on your iPad. So when you're controlling this helicopter, you're looking at your iPad and you can see where it's going in the room. You know, you can, you can land it, you can hover above people and that sort of thing. And that's using augmented reality because there's also video games attached with it. So for example, if I'm flying the helicopter in this room, I can see an alien over there and I can go over and shoot that alien virtually on the screen when it's, when it's actually not in the room, obviously. So, you know, and, and so what happens when innovation uh, doesn't lead to execution? It, it means you have to do an acquisition. And so that's, the, uh, that's one of the, 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 the challenges with, you know, being in a large organization, moving through some of these uh, edgy innov innovations forward. So. So um, basically, things were really good <laughs> from 2006 till about early 2008, when uh, you know we were we were just killing it. We were we were coming up with amazing products, putting them out to market. You know, we had this grand strategy, and then uh, boom, there was a couple of decisions were made. So one decision was that HP wanted us to scale across the globe, which was a great decision. But the other thing that happened was the uh, the economy collapsed at the same time, and so. 
you know, in the process of HP saying, look, we want to scale this business, um, they, they took the, the desktops, put them in the desktops business, they took the notebooks, put them in the notebook business, and, uh, you know, they created HP Envy and that sort of thing. But the challenges really are, can you take a Ferrari and put it into a, you know, a, a manufacturing uh, process that's not hands-on like a Ferrari is? And, and that's where things kind of got a, a little bit, uh, shall we say, not as, uh, <laughs> as, as well executed as I would have liked. You know, my, my personal vision was to see Voodoo uh, continue on and go forward. But, you know, in 2008, things went really kind of south in that sense. The thing is, um, the brand is still there. It's still alive, and we're still doing stuff internally, but we're being very careful about how we apply that brand and what we do going forward. So, you know, why am I still there? Because I think there's, there, there's something that none of you know about this company, and it's just, it's, it's, it's just amazing how quickly things change um, in a big giant like that. You know, and, and it's always interesting. Like, every week there's something new, and, you know, there's always something interesting to go, to go look at. And the neat thing about HP is they've given me a little bit of flexibility as an entrepreneur to go and find things that I like doing, things that are interesting to me, to go around the organization and help it become successful. And we just bought Palm recently. So there's a lot of good things happening with Palm and WebOS as well. So that's, that's you know, one of the big reasons that I'm there. And, um, and it, it's actually quite exciting. So, so I just want to talk to you about creating a strategy. Now, you don't have to be an entrepreneur to create a strategy. This can be a strategy based on a research project that you're doing or something that you're doing for your own company. Um, you got to first decide whether you're in this for lifestyle or growth, okay? So, you know, do you want retirement, like when you're 60? Or do you want early retirement, like when you're 30? And that's the first thing that you have to think about. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's hard to get your mind around this. But if you're going into a business, you really have to decide if you want a fat income or if you're willing to, you know, just take one for the team <laughs> and, and, and keep your income very, very low and modest so you can actually build a, a growth and get capital growth out of the business that you're getting into. Um, and, and I've never seen a, a situation where you can do both. I mean, I've seen, I've seen situations where people go and they do a big VC round and they burn cash like crazy and they end up giving up a lot of their company in order to do that. Um, so it's really, it's, it's really a difficult thing to do unless you, you know, and if you decide you want to do growth, you want to do it as quickly as possible. So, you know, for example, look at Facebook, what they did, right? In 2003, no one knew who they were, and now, you know, they're just, they're everywhere. So um, that was a growth business. And so the other thing I want to say is it doesn't matter where you're from. Uh, you know, I hear, I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, no one's going to do anything with this little company from Alberta or Calgary. That's like the, that's actually backwards. It, it actually doesn't matter where you're from. And in fact, there's benefits from being from Canada. Because if you're, you know, in the case of Voodoo, for example, if you're a small Canadian company going in and taking on the big guys in the, in the US, the press just goes nuts and they pick up on that and they love that sort of thing. So, you know, there's that. There's also benefits with IRAP and uh, there's, a, there, there's a number of like in, in innovation uh, uh, opportunities in Alberta that you can take advantage of. So um, being from Alberta is actually been a real benefit for, for at least what I've done with uh, the businesses that I've been involved with. Um, and it's, it's always good to start with an exit plan before you go and, you know, start your business and start hiring people and do all of this stuff. Um, and what I mean by that is when, when you're building your business plan, start backwards. Sort of like when you're reading a book, you know, you read the last chapter to see what's going to happen before you read the book. Some people do that. I don't know. I mean, I don't do it personally, but when it comes to business, I definitely start with the exit. And, and it really involves uh, studying your industry and knowing it very well and understanding the holes that the large companies have in the particular space that you're in. So, you know, in the case of BrightSquid, we studied the industry and said, okay, well, there's many holes. There's Google, there's, uh, there's um, uh, Microsoft Health, there's um, Agfa, there's a number of companies that, that could take something like this on. And, uh, and, and so we came up with like at least six different acquisition targets, and they're already starting to kind of uh, call us. And you know, as I said, there was a deal already done with the company, but the bottom line is, if you do your strategy properly, and you find the holes in your competition, and you find the holes in the industry, you'll know it works when they start calling you, right? That's really the, uh, the, the, the goal to, uh, to building a proper strategy. Um, and your strategy should be simple. 
Uh, everyone in your company should get it. Everyone. You should be able to do it on one piece of paper, explain it very quickly on a slide, and you should also use, uh, I use the wife and mom test. You know, it, it's not to, not to like belittle my mom in any way or, or my wife. My wife doesn't have any interest in computers whatsoever, but, you know, or any technology. But when I explain to her a business that I'm doing, I'll kind of give her a, a, a strategic view of what's going on. And if she agrees with it or she buys into it, then that's a big deal. So it should be extremely simple. And don't be afraid to change it. That is the most important thing out of all of this that, that, you, that you need to know, is if, if you are in your business and you notice that it's just not working, something's not happening properly, um, you need to change it. And you just need to make sure you tell everyone <laughs> that you're changing it. You know, so you work with your core team, and, you, and you, the, the best way to do this is to find what it is that you're really good at, you know, what it is that your team is good at, and then cut off all the stuff that you're not good at and focus on that core. That's what we did at Voodoo, where we focused on gaming. We, we got rid of all the other stuff. We got rid of the web design. We got rid of all the networking, all the, all the other stuff that just wasn't interesting to us and focused on gaming. That's what we're doing at Bulls. We got rid of uh, um, forums and, and collaboration tools and stuff that just weren't being used. And the, the traders and the team is now focused on uh, what they do best, which is you know, education and that sort of thing. So tweaking your strategy is completely healthy. There's no such thing as a perfect company. And it's, it's just the, it's, it's the best way to, to make sure that you can get things done on a quicker basis and get a better cadence. And then your exit. Um, you need to know your targets. So like I mentioned before, if your strategy is successful, they'll be calling you, right? And if, is there management alignment? Um, you you, you want to make sure that uh, that uh, you're you know you're not just taking a check and selling your company. You want to make sure that there's alignment between your management team and their management team. And as I've seen, you know, with HP, management does tend to change very quickly in a large company. It's it's shocking how how amazing you know that change happens in a in a company like that. Um, so you know, attrition can kill a plan. So you know, if every if everyone's aligned. Uh, it's likely that you won't have much attrition, and I think that's important to note. And do you plan to work there for long? You know, it, as the person who started the company, or as the people that started the company, um, you know, are you attached to the brand? Can you let it go? What do you want to be when you grow up? You know, that kind of thing. You, you, you need to think about all of that stuff going in, because you need to structure a deal in a way that you, you can have that flexibility down the road to make a decision and still stay true to, the, true to what, you, what you were in the past. So, being an entrepreneur and a giant, um, yeah, big companies change. And uh, I don't know if any of you follow HP, but, you know, things change. That's, that's about all I can tell you about that. Um, you need to operate like a startup. So, the thing that I find being in a big company is if you can build small performance teams and, uh, and learn how to work outside the walls within, in other words, um, you know, you're still working within the walls, you're still working within the, you know, how the organization works, but you're building smaller teams and you're giving them, uh, you're, you're treating them like a, their own startup. Each team is treated like their own startup and they're working within the walls of the organization but thinking outside the box. Um, and any of you who's worked in a large company knows what I'm talking about when it comes to working, you know, within a, a, a corporate environment and being a good corporate citizen. So, you know, operating like a startup may seem like a challenge, but it's not. Apple does that. You know, they operate like a giant startup. And don't get comfortable. If you start losing your edge, then you better change because uh, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll forever be deflated and you'll never get it back. So never get comfortable um, if you start to lose your edge in anything that you're doing. And don't underestimate your worth. <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the thing. I, I've, I've spoken to many <laughs> entrepreneurs. who I spoke to one the other day, actually, and I'm getting them involved in, a, in, in this other company. Um, who, uh, who's a brilliant designer, a brilliant designer. And he was so proud of himself because he created this, this amazing uh, online tool. Um, and it took him three weeks. And, uh, or she, sorry, uh, uh, one month, three weeks. And it's used by tens of thousands of people online. Um, and uh, he sold it for $15,000. What was he thinking? You know, and I was like shocked. I couldn't believe that he sold it for $15,000 and he got like a very small piece of the company that uh, acquired it. And so, you know, never underestimate your worth because if you do that, you'll end up like him. And uh, that's not good. And uh, that's it. So, I mean, I hope, 
I wasn't too short or you know boring or whatever. But uh, you know, I'd love to answer questions um, if there are any. Yep. Uh, thanks, Earl. My name is Earl Dodd, and I'm part of the Rocky Mountain Supercomputing Centers. And uh, <clears throat> what you've said is very interesting. If you come to our talk around 2:45, we'll leave, maybe even answer your question there. But uh, my question, and I, I grew up in that other big behemoth called IBM, mm -hmm. and uh, tried to be a serial entrepreneur in, in there. But um, I'm curious, uh, in general, one of the big obstacles for small businesses or the entrepreneurs is financing, in, in general. And uh, how do you see folks like HP, IBM, the big behemoths, uh, actually helping uh, create innovation with uh, these uh, entrepreneurs by providing some form of financial support? You know, I, I, I think that's a great idea. Um, I, I think it's, it would be amazing if we were able to create a, uh, uh, a startup incubator within HP, for example, and, and, uh, and fund companies outside. Um, you know, it's something I've always wanted to do. Um, I, I think there are, there are challenges getting that sort of stuff. You, you know, there's huge M&A departments, there's lawyers, there's all this sort of stuff that you have to go through. Um, how I see it working right now is it, it's not. I, 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 think, I think the, you know, it, it works through universities, um, you know, where, where, where HP will do like research grants with like the University of Calgary and that sort of thing. But when it comes to, uh, you know, actual companies, there, there's nothing like that. I, I think the, the, the closest thing to it would be acquisitions, and they happen all the time. So, um, so you know, for a small business trying to get out there and, and do something great, um, it, it's, 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 it's an, an amazing idea, and I think it, I think it should be done, but I, I think there's other avenues. Well, I have that an idea that sometime I'd like to talk about. Sure, about. yeah. Yes, way in the back. <laughs> oh, sorry, you're going to pass the microphone around. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, my name's Andy Blundell. Uh, my question's a little bit colored perhaps by experience in the oil patch where companies tend to do acquisitions to buy the assets and get rid of the people as soon as possible. Yep. But um, your strategy is, I think, implicitly um, one for people who want to stay working with the ac acquiring company. Any thoughts on strategies for those who want to be serial startup entrepreneurs? Yeah, um, you know, the, the, uh, the one strategy I would say there is just make sure that you're, uh, you, if you get hit by a bus, that the company can continue running, right? So when you build the company, you want to build an ecosystem around you so you're insulated and you're of no value to the acquirer. Um, that's the most important thing. If you're, if you're the most, you know, for Voodoo, uh, I was a big part of the deal, and, and so therefore, you know, I'm with the company. But it's something I wanted to do. But if I, if, if, if I wanted any of the other companies to get, you know, acquired, like, say, for example, Brightswood. Well, I'm not a radiologist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not, none of that stuff. I know nothing about medicine. I just know what I'd like to see. They don't care about me. And so th that's, the, that's the kind of thing you want to make sure you build the right team uh, to create that kind of business or that environment. Yes, next question. Hi, uh, Stuart Lomas with uh, ABC Tech. Um, listening to uh, the, all the cool stuff that you've done, the, the themes that kind of run through it that I, that I see is uh, a lot of passion and focus and especially uh, building the right team and, and the way you've worked with your teams. Now, I've seen in, in some other acquisitions where uh, focused technical teams have been taken over by you know, multinationals that they immediately try to spread the development across the planet. In fact, I'm watching this happen with one right now. Uh, do you have any experience with that, and have you ever seen it actually uh, work? Uh, I've, I've only seen it, well, I'll, I'll just come right out there and say it. It, it only works, um, uh, in, in the case of Voodoo, what worked with 40 people going to HP was we changed the way HP thinks about business. Does it work to spread the company across the world? No. When, you take it, when a big company takes on a smaller acquisition, they have to be very careful about how they scale the business. Um, so. You know, usually big acquisitions work when they take on big acquisitions. You know, when, when you buy like a multi-billion dollar company, then, then they work great. But when, you, when, you, when you're a large company and you're buying a smaller company and, um, you know, your immediate reaction is to go in and try and scale it, um, you start to have culture clash, uh, you, you can have attrition, 
um, and, uh, and it, it, it may not work. Um, and, and I think what we've learned at HP, uh, especially after Voodoo and a few other small acquisitions that took place in like 2006 and 2007, um, we've, we've, learned to, we've learned a number of things. Uh, for example, um, you know, when a new acquisition comes in, don't let the IT team put their hands on them, right? I'm serious. It's, 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 it's unbelievable dealing with the IT team because they're just like, it's just, it's crazy. You know, it's a big company and they've got tons of controls and stuff that can really cripple you know, a little guy, right? And uh, don't let the real estate team come in and start changing stuff. Because if, you know, if they go into a small startup that's a kind of edgy design and stuff and they start dropping in cubicles, you got a serious problem. So, you know, there's, there's things that you learn as you go forward, you know, what not to let happen and what not to touch. Um, so. It can work. It just it just through experimentation you figure out how to make it work. Next, uh, Rene Barcelo from uh, Society for Arts and Technology in Montreal. Uh, what about uh, most of the innovation programs are funding uh, research and development in uh, universities or private research centers? Uh, there is no company there. There is only licensing possibilities. What is that a real strategy? Uh, that's not actually the case. Um, you know, I, I know UTI tries to license stuff to larger companies, for example. In the case of HP, we actually have our own labs all over the world. We have, uh, you know, tons of PhD researchers working on things, um, you know, through HP Labs. And, uh, and, and that's where that, the, the, that video came in, uh, was through HP Labs. I mean, they created that, that whole, you know, gaming concept. And, um, and so uh, these, these research labs, one of the things that we found was they, you know, many of them were working on stuff that like are 10 or 15 years out, you know, and, and, and you walk in and there's like dinosaurs working there, you know, working on like this, you know, stuff that you're never going to see in, in, a, in a long period of time. So what, what, uh, what HP Labs is doing is we're, we're turning uh, those research projects into, you know, select ones and, and they're, um, they're basically limiting the projects to select projects that actually have an impact on product over you know, a certain period of time. And so um, you know, one of my roles as a, a CTO at HP is to go around to HP Labs, look at some of the stuff that they're working on and see how it can be commercialized with the businesses. Um, so there's, there, there, there are ways to turn research into reality. You know, there, there's no better motivator for a researcher than to see their idea come to life. Yeah, right? but my question is, um, we have a research lab, we're developing very innovative technology but we don't want to start a company. We, I mean, the technology, there's a business model for it, there's everything. Is, is starting a company the first step, or is there still uh, space for uh, uh, finding a partner in the uh, commercial world and uh, developing that company together? I, I, think it, I think it depends on, the, you know, what the company is doing. Um, you know, n nobody wants to go out and acquire a research lab for the sake of just research, right? Um, if there's no roadmap to, you know, success and how to actually turn it into money, um, then I, I think it'd be hard pressed to get bought out. Now, if it's research around medicine, for example, like biotech or something like that, then there's plenty of partners out there that would, you know, be willing to t take on something like that. So it really depends on the on the case, you know, what you're doing. Hi yep. there, Everett Teves from uh, Cybera. I'm a developer with Cybera. Um, I was wondering, how did you go about valuing your companies before you sold them? Good question. Uh, well, we, we looked at, you know, industry comparables, um, you know, in the case of, of Voodoo, for example. Um, but it was, it was mostly about brand and, uh, and what's, you know, what the brand that we were able to build and the, uh, the mind share that we were able to build around our brand. Um, how we valued it is we just went in high, you know, and said, like, this is what it's worth, and this is what we do, and this is what we can bring to your company. I mean, let's face it, you know, you're, you're going into a multi-billion dollar company. It's not like they can't afford to, you know, to, to, to buy you if you can give the right value back into the organization. So, um, so yeah, you got to start high, you know. Don't go in and undersell yourself. Yeah. Lorena Forstrom with Tech Edmonton, right here. Yeah, sorry. I'm wondering if you can just comment on what you see as the the gaps in this in small companies, sort of their road to success. Um, you talked about IRAP, and I'm familiar with that organization. Tech Edmonton also provides 
we provide sort of business, it's not for profit, provides business related um, services yep. to companies. And I'm just wondering if you can comment on that. Like what, what, what are the main gaps that you see? The main gaps are small business? Small businesses uh, growing, yeah. I think it goes back to, you know, they didn't build the right strategy. Um, they haven't figured out what their exit is. They don't know what their long-term goals are. So, you know, if they, if they start backwards again with small business and say, what is our exit? Number one, you know, what is our end goal? Do we want to retire when we're 65 or do we want to retire when we're 30? You know, you got to decide that first. Once they've decided that, um, you know, in terms of what is the lifestyle or growth business, then they can go into their strategy and build their strategy. And I think, the, the reason small businesses fail is because they don't revisit their strategy often enough, and they don't cut the crap. Like, they, they, they continue to have, like, all these arms and stuff of things that they do, and they don't realize that the stuff that they're doing that's a distraction, that's not really generating a lot of income, and it's not, you know, it, it, it doesn't excite people, they're not focusing on what they do best. So um, it's, it's, it's about revisiting the strategy and focus, and, um, and I think that you know, those rules in, in themselves, that one slide would make a big difference to a number of small businesses, so. Um, uh, I guess Voodoo to a lesser extent and a company like Apple to a large extent are successful mostly because of fanboyism. Yeah. So do you think, in a way, for a startup, uh, presentation is more important than substance? No, I, I think it's, I think uh, in order to build evangelists, which is what you're talking about, you, you need to build something that they believe in and that they can use and they can go out and evangelize. If you're not building a great product, you'll never have evangelists. Well, iPod 4 is not a great product, but it's getting the, the iPhone 4 is not iPhone a great. iPhone 4? Yeah. Well, no, I, iPhone 4 is a great product. It is. It's a, uh, it's a fantastic, beautiful operating system. You know, uh, they, have a, they have a long uh, history of, of evangelists that they've created that you know, will go out and evangelize their product. Um, you can't pick out one product from a, you know, from a company that's had a history of making great products, right? If, if, if uh, for example, if you look at Dell, um, you know, and, and, and I, will, I will not uh, disparage competition in any way, but if you look at Dell and you look at what they've done historically, in 2005, when Michael Dell called me, um, this was in November of 2005, he called Voodoo, he called me, in particular, and, and said, like, let's meet, let's talk about, you know, doing a, a deal with, uh, with Voodoo and Dell, how can we make this work? And I went to visit him, and one of the things that uh, I told him was, I think Apple is their biggest threat. And he laughed at me, and he said, uh, Apple spends as much money on R&D as Dell does, therefore Dell is more profitable. And earlier that year, the CEO of Dell said the iPod was nothing more than a fad. And, and so, when you look at that, um, Dell does not have fans. In, like a fan base like Apple does. The reason Apple has evangelists and fans is because they made a great product and they, you know, and they, they nurtured their community. Any company that can build a fan base is amazing. So Palm actually has a fan base of evangelists. But if, you know, if, if, if we don't execute and we don't create great product going forward, we'll quickly lose them. And Voodoo had a community of evangelists and, fan, and fanboyism. And I think that fact, fanboyism and, and community and evangelists is so huge, companies don't even realize how huge that is. You know, and how to create that is, is the most important thing. And how you create that is by creating great products that invoke emotions in those people. So I don't know how many companies you can point out that have fans and evangelists, but I bet you it's not that many. Like if you go and look at like the Fortune 500 list and, and pick out different companies that have them, you know, anyone that does is just, you know, they, they're, they're sitting on something huge. So, yep. Hi, good morning. Uh, Two-part question. Uh, first, my name is John Morin with Industry Canada. Uh, first one is uh, you haven't talked, you've talked a, lo a little bit about financing and, and the entrepreneurial environment. Uh, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to what your belief is the skill set is in Canada currently. Is that, is that something that's a strength? Is it something that needs addressing uh, or are we, we, we vulnerable or at risk there? And the second question the is skill set regarding uh, uh, just the hi bringing highly qualified people. Okay. You know, the entrepreneurs, the yeah. innovators. Are, are we generating them through our 
university system or is, is that an area that you sense is, is a bit of a gap? And the second one is uh, try to maybe f now going forward in five years, what do you think the marketplace is going to be like for technology companies? And, and, and the reason I ask, some believe that we need a couple anchor firms like the RIMS in Canada and that that's critical and we got to do all we can to create them or hold on to them. And then others think, no, it's, you, you know, it's just North America is going to be a marketplace and people will be scattered all over and it won't really matter where the firm based is. Maybe yourself as a good, as, as a good example. Um, so I guess my question in that is, do you think it's important that Canadian or Canada retain some, some high anchor firms in, in high tech? I absolutely think it's important that Canada does. Um, you know, I, I think RIM's anchor, by the way, is, is being lifted right now. And, uh, and, and, and the reason that's happening is because they focus too much on enterprise and not the user. But the, the, the point being is um, uh, there is talent in Canada. But they're moving to the valley. You know, they're, they're moving to places like Seattle and the valley where they feel opportunity is. Um, and, and that has to do with the Canadian government uh, and the Alberta government and the various governments not putting the right branding on it, you know, not turning it into the Silicon Valley North, you know, and not uh, incentivizing these companies to come here and stay here, you know, and, and, and stay put. And, um, and, and when you think about technology, the first thing that comes to your mind is the valley. You know, I'm moving to the valley. I'm Facebook. I'm going to the valley. I want to do this. And, and, and the reason it's like that is they've built this brand around the valley. And uh, you've got Apple and HP based in Cupertino. Um, and, and all these companies come, you know, flocking in that area. Um, we could build a valley in Alberta. You know, we could build the Silicon Valley North here. Uh, but we're just, we're branded as oil and gas and cowboys, right? And that's... Uh, that's just uh, unfortunate, but that's the way it, it is. Everyone thinks about oil and gas in Alberta. And that's, you know, in many ways it's okay. If you want to build an oil and gas company, a technology company that, you know, focuses on oil and gas and that sort of thing, it's fine. But if you want to be like a real technology firm, it's, it's difficult uh, to, you know, to base yourself here and, and reason with, you know, why you want to be here rather than down there. So arguably, um, though, if we did that in Canada, we'd probably be Kitchener Waterloo. There you go. Yeah, well, we, we would be at this point, yeah, yeah. And the other one was about skills. Where do you think we're at in terms of capacity? Well, there is so many smart people here. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the value of, um, uh, there, there, there are so many great technologists here and designers and, uh, that just don't get the opportunities that you know, they should get, uh, so they end up moving. But um, the, the, talent ba the talent pool here is immense. Um, the schools are great. Um, you know, they, uh, they, they, they do deliver the, the right content, the right messages to their students. Um, but, you know, people are going to go where opportunity is, is hot, right? And uh, right now, either you have an app store in your basement, you know, and you're making millions making apps, or you're, you're moving to the valley and doing something there, you know, in, in specifically in technology. So, and even the Seattle area, it's, a, it's an amazing place to go for, for tech. So, next one. Thank you for your presentation, Raul. My name is Reiner Arashko. I'm with TR Labs. And what came through to me in your presentation was one exit strategy, clearly, which mm -hmm. is through acquisition. I had the good fortune of being down in the valley and part of a founding team of a couple of other startups that uh, went IPO, so I'm familiar with that exit strategy. I was wondering if you could kind of enumerate or just go through the exit strategies that you see in the next five-year time frame, and if you can perhaps just comment on the pros and cons of them, and if possible, enumerate or classify them as, here's an exit strategy if you're looking to get out before you're 30, and I'm just looking from that from an, I'm over 30, so it doesn't apply, and then those which are, well, I'm looking to retire with this company. So from my perception, the IPO market seems to be kind of closed right now, and acquisition came through as yours. Yep. Other than those two, what are the exit strategies you see and which are the ones that we should be looking for over the next five years? So there's, uh, okay, so other than IPO and, and being acquired, um, you know, there's the, there's the partnership, um, you know, where you build like a licensing model. Um, you know, if your organization has something that's, that's hot that, you know, someone needs. Um, and, and what you do is you, you find the hole in the other organizations that need it. And if they haven't heard of you, then you're probably not there yet, but if they have heard of you and you can start talking to them, you can talk about doing some sort of licensing model and perpetuity, you know, where you constantly have income. Um, you know, but, but to be, to be qu quite honest, I mean, the, the way the markets are going right now, uh, uh, tech is so hot that uh, acquisitions are the big thing. And, um, you know, innovation outside of the, 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 the giants 
is, is very hot right now. And so the Giants are trying to, you know, acquire as much talent as they possibly can. So, um, so you know, there's, the, you, just have to, you just have to think about that, you know. I, I, think, I think if you build something that uh, has a, fills a significant hole in a big company, you're, you're likely to get acquired. So, yeah. You had talked briefly about this movement of jobs moving offshore, and I wonder if you had any thoughts or perspective on, in, in general, what you think um, uh, countries like China and, and India are doing right and maybe even what they're doing wrong. Sure. Um, well, what, what they're doing right, first of all, what China is doing right, uh, I'm going to just give you a, an example of how they're building their infrastructure. Um, there is an airport in a in a very small town uh, just out of Shanghai, uh, and it's a and there's a facility there, a manufacturing facility that builds PCs for HP, and um, and uh, and that's all they do is 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 tons of HP computers shipped all across the Asia Pacific area, and uh, <laughs> the uh, the the airport did not have a runway big enough for the plane required to ship you know, the devices that, that needed to be shipped or the volume of devices that needed to be shipped. And uh, so, you know, some people at HP approached the government in that city and said, hey, look, you know, we need a bigger, we need, like, we need to put a bigger plane on this runway. So they went out and they built a runway specifically for, you know, this need. And, um, you know, and, and so they, they're investing in their infrastructure just like that. I mean, they made a decision overnight to do this, and, and things just got moved very quickly to make this happen. Um, they're, they, are, uh, they are doing things like learning from, you know, learning from the Americans in terms of the designs. Like if you look at, even, even the Canadians, like you look at BlackBerry and you look at Apple, iPhone and stuff like that, and uh, you, there's a company called HTC that's taking all of the, you know, the design ideas and, and that sort of thing and they're, and they're commoditizing it in a way that they can go out and create this stuff in China uh, directly with no brand, um, you know, and, and very little IP. And, uh, and, and then, you know, put this out on a, on a global market scale. Um, and then become an ODM for companies like T-Mobile, where you have, like, T-Mobile branded phones, for example. Um, so, you know, China is investing in their infrastructure. They're doing things to incite companies to be there. Um, and, and, and they're doing things to copy, you know, what's, what's happening o over here. Um, and, and they're even doing things in green tech, you know, green technology. You know, when it comes to like you know, biofuels and things like that, there's a lot of stuff happening in China as well. Um, uh, and even oil and gas. I mean, they're, they're hoarding oil in a big way. Uh, China is going around and cutting deals with like companies in the oil sands of Alberta, you know, to to uh, to get oil. So they're they're doing all sorts of stuff to invest in their own infrastructure, their own growth. The big challenge China has is they need to continue on eight percent GDP. Otherwise, they're in a lot of trouble because uh, you know they got a lot of people. Um, they got to employ uh, you know an entire country essentially, and you know they got to keep the growth coming to keep these people living, essentially. So that's a big challenge in itself. Um, India is uh, the, the the biggest problem in India is there there's a there's no social conscience there whatsoever. There's uh, e extremely rich people, and then there is uh, extremely poor. But now there's an emerging middle class, which is nice to see. But when I say there's no social conscience, they're, they're so used to you know, seeing like some of the poverty that, that you, know, you see in some of the villages and that sort of thing there, that the ultra rich, like, they almost, it almost seems like they don't care. And that's, that in, that's not a good thing. Um, but the middle class in India is uh, amazing. The, you know, the technology industry, uh, we've got offices in Bangalore, we have offices in Hyderabad. Um, the technology industry is just amazing because these guys are you know, developing and, and they're building um, uh, call centers and, and uh, even, even offshore development centers in India. So India and technology, they're doing great things. Um, the thing that India is probably not doing so well is, uh, and they're just starting to, is, is, is sort of building like brands that they can bring, you know, bring overseas. Um, they haven't really done a good job of that. And, and, and so, you know, you look at Tata, for example, and they just bought Jaguar, you know, so they can, so they can do that sort of thing. So, you know, India is not as good as China when it comes to building those brands and being able to come overseas. hope that answers that question. Hi, I'm James Van Loon, a technology consultant and entrepreneur. 
And uh, I want to come back to this issue of the culture of innovation. We look down to the Silicon Valley where they've been incredibly successful yep. in fostering that culture of innovation. And what we need to do here if we want to foster a, a Silicon Valley North. Uh, the role that in infrastructure plays in fostering that culture of innovation. You mentioned, for instance, uh, providing uh, office space, free office space, you yep. know, where entrepreneurs can work. What else do you envision as being essential infrastructure for fostering that culture of innovation? Well, um, so you know, the, if, if they were to build like a center of innovation, let's say, right, and it's it's a it's the free office space that I spoke about, but then bringing in technologies like, for example, a halo room, you know, from companies seeing which ones align with what they're doing, and then just keeping in touch with them, I think that would be a big deal as well. So, um, so you know, somebody somebody out there needs to needs to make this happen, and I don't know who that is, but I think it has to be somebody who has a bit of an entrepreneurial background and 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 has the uh, the vision to kind of put this together. Um, so. You see networks playing a significant role. Sorry? Networks. Networks. Uh, what do you mean? Oh, well. Broadband. Yeah, I mean, broadband providers definitely play a, a significant role. Um, although, I, I don't know if you follow, like, for example, wireless broadband versus land broadband, but there's a, uh, there's a, a, a fundamental business. Uh, problem that they have, and, and that is that broadband is getting cheaper, and they're not making any more money. And so, um, you know, so there's this thing about, like, net neutrality and, you know, trying to bring on their own exclusive services to their, to their broadband and that sort of thing. Um, I think broadband providers are in trouble, um, and I think they, they need to figure out a way to, uh, you know, to embrace the, the fact that consumers do want cheaper broadband. Uh, they don't want to pay per kilobyte, and uh, they need to figure out a way to monetize it better. So. Uh, you know, sure, there's probably a play there, but I don't know what it is. I hate to be in that business, to be honest. It'd be difficult to figure out. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's a fascinating one that James just raised, Ned. I'd like to run that one as well, but I've got a question I've been dying to ask, so I'm going to bring us back a moment or so. Um, if you look at the companies that you've started up, um, there's a real drive there. You're seeing the, the opportunities. You're developing. and growing these really cool ideas into companies that then typically are acquired rather than trying to grow them into take over the world. Right. Um, you've said that you can continue to act like a startup once you get inside a big company and some examples that you've given us of how you've managed to keep your group together with an HP or with an Apple. Um, would you say, however, and I, I, I think I know where I suspect the answer is on this one, but you've done it. Is the innovation more powerful? Is it, a, is it better driven? Does it happen more readily in a real startup rather than a business unit within a big company? Yeah, it does. Uh, some, someone asked me the other day, <laughs> there was, a, uh, there was a, a, a forum of investors that come together, some Alberta forum of investors, and, and they have these like, companies come in and pitch their ideas to this group of people. And one company came in and they had this, this piece of software that allows you to download games, uh, PC games. And, and play them on your PC with DRM and stuff. And, and so when they left the room, everyone started out pounding me, asking me questions about this company. You know, are they worth anything? You know, what do you think? And um, the guy spent around $300,000 to build this company. And he said, well, you know, couldn't you just go out at HP and spend, you know, $300,000 and build it? I said, well, we could, but it would cost us $10 million. It would take us five years of investigation and, you know, and uh, management by committee and all this stuff to make it happen. Uh, and uh, it, we never would get there, right? We wouldn't have what this guy has in a matter of three months. So smaller companies can innovate quicker. In the case of Voodoo, that red system I showed earlier with the, you know, the, the magazines behind it, that system took three months from sheet metal to completion, and it won every major award in the industry you know, after it was completed, but three months to create. And, uh, and uh, at HP, it takes 18 months to do the same sort of thing. And you're still not going to get like all the details that we put into the one that took three months. So in many ways, small companies do move quicker. But when it comes to innovation teams within a large organization, you can create an innovation team as long as it's outside the boundaries of the organization. And as long as there is a, a way to spin it back into the organization. And Cisco does that pretty well. So, uh, so I, I guess to try the, to tie that together with uh, that last question from James, um, if, if the innovation happens most effectively when people are hungry, when they're in a startup, um, when they've got that drive, that means that 
um, we can drive benefits to our digital economy probably more effectively by making sure that the small innovators are empowered as, pos as, as much as possible. So the Tech Edmontons, Calgary Technologies, and when we look at, at, at Alberta, where 25% of our population don't have good access to the internet even, yep. um, if we can address some of those problems, it seems to me, and I, I, I well, yeah, because you'd agree you, you, that you that get would scale help. then, right? If if uh, you can address the, because there's still, you know, AT and T cries all the time about how much money they're not making anymore, but they're still making tons of money. So like, you know, cry me a river. But if if there's a way for them to scale their business into rural areas and build mesh networks and that sort of thing, that's when they that's what they need to start thinking about, and not oh woe is me, I'm not making enough money in my broadband. You know, they need to figure out how to scale it and make make more money that way. So. Great, yes. thanks again. Richard LaBelle again. Um, I'm just trying to summarize based on what you're saying here. Um, most of my work is, is international. Most of we look at uh, try to, 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 to encourage the use of information communication technologies as tools for development and focused on the developing world uh, with a view to sort of building competitive advantage. And one of the first things we do when we do an assessment and try to build entrepreneurship in SMEs is create incubation facilities. Yep. And one of the greatest incubation projects that I know is run by a telecoms billionaire from Canada called Charles Sirois, who has created something called Enablus, which funds in South Africa and Kenya the creation of SMEs, originally with a focus on the ICT and using ICT, information communication technology. But in Canada, if I understand properly, and I don't focus much on Canada even though I live here, the sense I have is there is no facility to, to encourage, to assist, to build the capacity of entrepreneurs to do what you did through incubation, for example. No, in fact, there's facilities to discourage it. It's called CCRA, and it's a nightmare because uh, <laughs> that's it, that I agree with. It's, and it's absolutely true. They're, they are they are brutal. They don't think about you know uh, the entrepreneur at all when it comes to you know how they operate, right? And um, and so you're absolutely right. It's 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 discouraging in, on many levels. Um, but it would seem to me that this is an opportunity for. Um, for a meeting such as this to raise that as a recommendation, yeah. but it's also for an opportunity, and I'm looking to our colleagues from Industry Canada here, to, to think strategically about what needs to be done to build this. I mean, this is, uh, incubation is not rocket science. We do it, we do it elsewhere uh, as part of our development aid programs. Yeah. Maybe we should do more of it here. Well, we, I completely I, agree. I don't understand if there's a lack on this issue. Because to me, it's one way of bridging the gap between uh, the opportunity, the capacity, uh, uh, the, the, te the technology, broadband. If we had incubation centers, if, for example, throughout this country, this conference was uh, streamed live by telepresence, okay, to other like-minded groups and organizations, that would be a significant impact. Last year, I was at COP15, the, uh, the, uh, the climate change summit. Yep. We worked with your competitors, Cisco. Uh, we created what was called the ICT at the climate change kiosk. We used telepresence to link in and bring in speakers from around the world. Yep. And it worked extremely well to the, to, the, to, the, to the point that many of us believe that you know, when conferences like this take place in the future, especially in large countries such as this one, that technology is going to have a significant role to play to bring people together. And it's not just to sort of talk about, you know, the, the program and the agenda at hand. It's to go into more depth in terms of collaboration, in terms of research, business, finance, everything. So to me, uh, one, of the, one of the interesting uh, opportunities that should come out of this conference is clear-cut statements about what we need to do in order to enhance not only research and broadband research in particular, but generally speaking, how do we build entrepreneurship in this country so we are more competitive? Because we are not competitive. No, we're not. And uh, when I speak later on about green IT and what's happening there, the Chinese are leading the green IT race right now because they're focusing on clean energy at the rate of a several hundred, not hundred billions, but billions of dollars a year. Yep. They're better than the Americans. So where are we? I don't know if that was a question or if that was... I, it's a rhetorical question. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Hi, I'm Anton Self, and I came in from uh, the East Coast in Halifax, mm -hmm. and I'll be speaking soon too, but I find it interesting, like some of the prevailing, there's lots of prevailing themes among uh, entrepreneurs, government people, et cetera, so some of the discussion that's taken, been taking place now, 
I find it so very interesting that your recommendations about like how Alberta could be more of a relevant, you know, information communications technology um, haven, you know, a place that would spur uh, the type of, you know, creative, collaborative development environment um, that we saw in the last century in Silicon Valley so successfully. I find it interesting that we we seem to invoke uh, real estate, you know, like you're saying, let's come up with some, you know, free rent, collaborative environment, physical space for people to work in. Or uh, you were asking about, uh, I forget exactly what you were asking about, but you know, it's the kind of thing I'd expect from Industry Canada. And, and I'm, I, don't, I don't mean that in a, you know, in a judgmental way at all, but it's about, we'll get to it. And you, were, and you were asking about jobs, but I wonder, if, you know, you, here you are, like, can't you preach what you practice? The reality is you're not working out of a center. And is it ever gonna happen again? Like, isn't it more important, you know, you, you touched on something most recently, the CRA thing. Like, let's, let's talk about what's in the very code, in this case, the tax code, to foster entrepreneurial endeavor. I think, this is my first time in Alberta, and I have to say, the things you guys have going for you are pretty obvious to me. You've got riches, you know, which you've been pulling out of the earth for decades now. And with those riches, with all of this entrepreneurial, um, you know, resources, you could do just about anything. Like you've got wisdom, you've got capital, you've got people, um, and it's a shame. And we see the same thing on the East Coast. You've got these wonderful people who are well-educated, who've got great skills, but they can't find the jobs. And yet right. paradoxically, you know, you guys are looking for job creation and you measure jobs in this really antiquated way. Um, the reality is everybody's got, you know, 10, 20 jobs today. You're working out of your basement. You're working in different locations. Are the Are the, so this is a question, and it is rhetorical. Um, but you've touched on some issues which I hope will prevail through this cool yeah, conference. I, I was just going to say one, one thing about the, the thinking about facility is uh, presence breeds excitement, and and uh, it's 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 real difficult to to manage a, an organization remotely, um, and and be successful unless you've done it before, and um, you know unless those people are used to working from home, you know, um, because uh, and and yeah, of course, companies are are now doing more. Uh, remote workers and that sort of thing, people who are capable of being productive and working from home and, and whatnot. But presence breeds excitement. And a facility uh, that, that, you know, of, uh, of um, like a world-class facility in an order of magnitude with great technology behind it and great companies behind it uh, would be a, uh, a great first step to, to, to keeping great talent in, in uh, Canada. So. Yeah, and so back to that very notion, because it's, it's something that troubles me at this point in time in Canada. I mean, here you've got this video with this, you know, kid running around with this little device, and everywhere he points it in this, uh, you know, sort of 19th century industrial urban landscape, you know, he, he sees this fantasy thing that he really wants to be playing a game in. But, so when you speak of facility, are we really talking about the, you know, that fancy device that H HP makes that, you know, facilitates like these incredible video conferences that right. rich guys like Steven Spielberg and Bill Gates can, you know, use out of their homes. Are we talking about that when it comes to facilities? In which case we're, we're decentralizing, not cent you know, centralizing people. No, I'm, I'm talking about a centralized facility and then that allows companies to be incubated, uh, you know, coached, uh, having the right people in there, having entrepreneurs that can help those businesses can go in and consult with those businesses, and those businesses don't have to pay for it. You know, a, a, a facility, a place you can go and you ride your bike to work, you know, that type of thing. That's, that's what I'm speaking of, because there is, there is, there, there is no better way to, uh, to invigorate people than being in front of them and to energize them, and, um, and I think that needs to be done. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I just find it interesting that we keep evoking these uh, ivory towers of campuses and facilities like we imagine, you know, Google's campus to be like, when our reality is that we're all working out of our homes and our basements and so on and, and we're creating, <laughs> no, 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 of course, yeah. but nonetheless, you know, like uh, even, even, you know, the public employees, the civil servants, the people who work for large companies like HP, et cetera, and increasingly so. And so I wonder if there's this, this um, I wonder, I wonder what it's really important to focus on. You know, are we. You, you know, the one thing I'll say is that once you plant roots, and and you uh, and you grow those roots, you can go. You can work from anywhere, but you have to plant the seed, and uh, the most successful way to plant the seed is through presence.